Welcome to the Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Claire Price, who is the president and CEO of Octane Growth Systems and the author of the book, Smart Marketing Execution, How to Accelerate Profitability, Performance, and Productivity. Now, what you should be wondering is what you're going to learn today and what you can learn from the book. And the book teaches you how to turn million dollar company into $10 million one, into $100 million one, billion dollars. And it really goes through the key questions of those of us wandering through the marketing desert. Where do I go? How do I get there? All in a lean, uh, small business, agile budget. Uh, and in addition to uh, the book, Claire is author of major marketing playbooks, Marketing OS. She's an expert in mar making remote work. And, and, which is quite fun, she has written a bone chilling cyber thriller, The Web of Betrayal or Web of Betrayal. Claire, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Claire, let's dive in because when I read one of the references in your book uh, related particularly to execution, where you said 40% of the strategy's potential value. Uh, breaks down in execution from the HBR article. This really resonated. We used some of the same logic in my past life at Success Factors to talk about employee and performance execution. And here you've really created a system to assure, ensure efficient marketing execution. Because all every, a lot of people think marketing is about, hey, I have this big idea. I'm going to throw some stuff against, creative stuff against the wall and hope it works. And you found a magic a system that actually kind of allows lean organizations to get their marketing done in, in you know aimful and effective way. So tell us more about the platform that you've built. So thank you very much, Alex. We look at marketing from the standpoint of the first thing that you need to do is build a strategic foundation. We call it a blueprint. You can't build a house without a blueprint. One of my one of my favorite stories is you want to see a house built without a blueprint. Go check out the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California, and that, see yeah. <laughs> uh, what it's like for to have a house with uh, doors that don't open, stairs that go nowhere, et cetera. And we see that a lot in our small business and medium-sized business companies. The, the critical pain point of not having a strategic blueprint and just doing stuff, what I call frantic marketing activity is that you cannot scale. You absolutely cannot scale because you're caught in that owner-operator scramble 100% of the time. And the only way to get out of that scramble is to build systems. And that is why a $1 million company can become a $10 million company. They can scale because they have systems in place that do not rely on one or two or three people, but can create a team around it. Got it. I, I, I'm going to actually drill in. And for those of you that are listening, uh, check go check out on YouTube. I'm going to share one of the my favorite illustrations from Clara's book, um, <laughs> where uh, it's called Five Growth Killers, right? And some of the issues that you've just highlighted right now about lack of uh, lack of a system, systematic approach. The the one that I think is kind of a lot of people relate to is the hamster marketing and the lottery marketing. So the yes. hamster and this, the image that, that comes next to it is like a, you're running on a hamster wheel and you're like, I'm going to do more outbound this or I'm going to do, you know, more crappy SEO hoping we're going to somehow, somehow outsmart Google. And, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, those let's dig into those two. Uh, just to kind of illustrate the common uh, challenges for 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 a scrappy team and as they approach their growth. Yeah, let's start with hamster marketing. So hamster marketing, as you well described, Alex, is the situation where the business owner, the marketing team, is just constantly running in circles, trying to find the right solution to their marketing problem. And for most of the clients that we work with, which are the, the scaling business at the small and medium size, it's lead generation. Yeah. And it is also lead conversion. And unless you have a real plan to reach those clients, 
get their attention, engage them, and really follow a, a well-defined customer journey, you're just going to keep scrambling. And what happens is, and this, this is a true story for one of my clients, is the, the people, your top talent starts uh, disappearing. They yeah. go somewhere else because they get to burn out in that constant struggle to do absolutely everything, you know, at, at a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, it's sort of you're running, your hair on fire all the time. And then I think the, the interesting part that one of my favorite marketing uh, uh, tech executives that came here um, um, said, uh, you know, marketers tend to ruin any party they go to. And I think the hamster wheel is sort of where we kind of start overusing a marketing tactic. Uh, in, obviously, because it's sort of five years ago that it was created, it has diminishing returns for many of folks and so the the hamster wheel is actually like it's a leaky bucket you know oftentimes as well it's not just a circular absolutely thing, right? absolutely uh, that's a great analogy ruin any party that they that they go to <laughs> and i think it's because they don't take the time to build the foundation they don't take the time to build yeah. the relationships it's all like well and i've had this experience with agencies that i've both hired and fired where they will come in and they'll say, well, you know, for example, the big thing on LinkedIn, well, let's, you know, let's do 75 contacts a day and it's all a numbers game. It's not a numbers game anymore. I think that right. that's another key component. And that's where the lottery marketing comes in, you know, just throwing your money at uh, whatever that, you know, different game casino game is and pulling the handle and seeing what you get. And it, it works just enough to get you to keep trying to, to pull the handle. Got to get out of those, those um, negative and right. um, pain point marketing issues. And it sounds like the, 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 the winner, the casino wins. And in this case, the Facebook ads and the, and the Google ad teams, they're the winners in, in some of those games or the yeah. outbound agency, which you right. spend money on. Right. But that sort of is potentially polluting your brand message and your target market. They are, they are sort of, they don't have as much at stake as your business does. Right. And those seem to be exactly. the, the trade-offs. So um, anything else that you see that will wake up one of our audience members and say, gosh, I gotta, I gotta do this urgently now. Right. Because I've got, 500 problems, marketing is one of them, or you know, maybe let's say 50 of them or 100 of them, but it's not the only one, right? There's product, there's other things. Why do you think getting the marketing execution is so key for you know, emerging businesses? Because you can't grow if, you're, if your marketing isn't effective. You cannot grow. Because you as a business owner or you as a team of three, five, 10 can't get in front of enough prospects, in front of enough new customers to bring in the amount of revenue that you need to continue to scale your business. If you want to, you know, scale it 2X, 10X, whatever you, that's why we see so many of the small businesses that are stuck at that revenue level, three to 5 million and never get out of it. They right. So there's a natural plateau. It's either your network or your marketing tactic that worked at the beginning, but kind of is saturated at this point exactly. and without a growth oriented system you will be stuck and it sounds like that's also true for small business for venture back business there's quite a lot that don't graduate to, you know from a you know pre-seed to series uh seed or series a even exactly. right and, and, and it's exactly. the same so it almost okay got it so the 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 movement it's kind of like that eddie uh woody allen quote right um uh, so something about the sharks that they 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 kind of they have to move to uh, to to stay alive, and so we yeah, kind of have to be a little bit like a shark to keep growing to stay alive. If you stop moving, um, you'll kind of stagnate. Yeah, if you if you stop moving, you you start dying. Got it. There is right. no there is no neutral position. Absolutely makes makes perfect sense. So one of the levers of the growth that is highly efficient that's near and dear to my heart that you brought up is content and the, you know there's kind of content at the top of 
the funnel that sort of influences and kind of brings people into your business. Then there is like, once you start on a buyer journey, there's this whole other set of content resources that you use. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, because sure. it sounds like this is some of the things that you help your clients with and you probably see, you know, what are the the kind of typical errors on, and kind of the full pass to use a you know French term of like of uh -huh. bad content that you've you've run across. I think the the biggest problem, Alex, with uh, content is that it's just again it's something that people produce without giving it a lot of full consideration. If you are going to produce good content, you have to understand who the audience is to the mm -hmm. to the individual content needs to be personalized it needs to be unique it needs to be really directed at small niches as opposed to huge mass audiences i think we know that from what we see with uh, the way the branding and marketing is gone number one so you've got to really zero in super tight on who your ideal customer is and not just who they are because I wrote an article recently that said, I don't really care who your customers are and you shouldn't either because it's not about who they are demographically. It's about why they buy and why they're going to buy from you. So you need to understand values and motivations, need what right. needs, wants and desires of that group and what their buying patterns are. Once you really have a clear idea of that, then you can craft messages that will resonate with that specific group. What is their pain point of the moment? Not what their pain point was a week ago, a month ago. What is it today? And once you have the customer and the message dialed in, then you can create amazing content, whether that content is video, whether, that, whether it's a white paper, whether it is a, a digital ad. That's when you can truly create content that is going to produce results. Yeah, it's interesting. It reminds me of one of the quotes that I love from your book is good marketing makes company look smart. Great marketing makes customer feel smart. And I think exactly. this is what you're saying effectively. It almost doesn't feel like marketing. It doesn't feel like, like you're trying to sell something. You're just basically articulating a journey that these folks are on, right? Like they, they already want to go from point A to point B or they're predisposed to go. Uh, and so you're just helping them uncover that versus like me, 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 me. Look at me, 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 me. And here's this and here's that. And, you know, look at how smart I am was this like 90 page PDF nobody could read or even want to read. Uh, Absolutely. And we like that. <laughs> Agree with you 100%. And I think that that is the biggest problem that we see with a lot of our clients when we start working with them, just talking about, con still talking about content, is their website presence their content on their website. It's it's almost always what we do, not yeah. how we, we you know, got how started we in a small your, garage. Yeah. And... yeah <laughs> well exactly. actually I want to I want to take one of your uh another one of one of my favorite charts from your book. Um I'm gonna screen share here really quickly about the sort of particularly the sort of top influencer content that's sort of up for, a little bit up front in the earlier part of the cycle. And you could see that case studies here in the chart is 47%. Webinars are high. Third-party an analyst reports. So this, I'm thinking of G2 for more smaller mm -hmm. businesses and software mm -hmm. and services. And then you, the reviews type of content. And then white papers, video, et cetera. Interestingly, blogs, very, very low on the list. 24% of uh, influencer, this content is found valuable by B2B buyers. Even though like that's when people say content, guess what 99% people think, right? And even like, and we like to think of the word content-led growth as, as what we do, at, for example, at Relate to. We're creating mm -hmm. content-led experience here right now together with right. you for our joint customers and audiences. But the when people say content, they think like a shitty you know, SEO oriented blog post done by outsourced team that barely knows your India, your, your, well, that it's a, 
whatever outsource location yes, barely knows your business that one. right and you know again not nothing not a geographic thing right like but it's just generally they're not experts and what they're doing is they're just finding somebody else who's done an authoritative post post and they're trying to regurgitate that in a slightly unique way and that feels atrocious frankly like it just feels like it's never going to work in the long term it feels like you're pretending to play a game of some kind and the customers are pretending to trust you on this. And it, I don't know why do you think that sort of the, you know, this contrast between everybody thinks it's blog and SEO type of content. And then in reality, A, people don't find it valuable um, that much. And B, you know, in reality, that game is going to get much, much tougher, you know, going forward was generative AI world and the, the, the speed of creating you know, spammy like content. garbage content. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I would, I would agree. I have strong you. opinions as you can see. Yeah. And <laughs> I, and I agree with pretty much everything you said. I think that most blogs do not relate to the customer. They are, they, again, they're from the point of view of the, of the, of the company. It's like, well, we want to tell you about what we're doing. We want to tell you about our product. We want to tell you about, um, how we sometimes how we help you the best blogs that I've seen out there that are that are passed around that are are blogs that teach that educate that yeah. get the get the customer get excuse me not the customer get the company out of it and put the customer in front and the other thing I think in in if you look I think if we did that chart today because it's charts a couple of years old yeah. uh, we would see that one of the biggest things that is available now that, that companies need to take advantage of, and I will underscore the word need three times, is user-generated content. That's right. Content that's provided by your customers as opposed to con content that's generated just within your internal teams. Yeah, absolutely. I want to give a shout out to one of our guests, Godar Abel, who is the, the founder and CEO of G2 which actually allows you to capture customer reviews. And sometimes some of them are great reviews. Some of them are legitimately, hey, you need to improve this. But that builds trust. Absolutely. And we love G2. And we can, if we, we, when we first started out marketing for our own product, you know, that was actually one of the first things we said, well, we might as well learn from our customers. Uh, and, you know, if they, if they like the product, uh, fantastic, right? Like that will kind of spread the word. And if they don't, like, it will make us move much more furiously in fixing some of the issues because, you know, it's kind of drives accountability. Ultimately, nothing drives accountability like a customer who gives you a thumbs up or thumbs down in public. Exactly. Uh, interesting. So back to the sort of the challenges of content when you think of what's people say, well, okay, content is important. It's sort of an effective channel. We believe marketing is important. Why are people producing mediocre content or wrong content types? And in our case, why, why is that content not as effective? Is it just the format? Is it the medium? Is the message uh, issues around it as well? Like what are your takes of the biggest challenges for people who already believe that co good content is good, but they still struggle to deliver. So I think there's a couple of things, Alex, that um, we have to look at. The first thing is, do they really understand their audience well enough to to create content that's that's targeted to them or will resonate with them? Mm. Number two, I think that a lot of times the content is bad because people are just, they you know, they run out of time. They've got quotas to meet. That's that's another. Let's let's talk about that for a minute. That's another yeah. issue for content, particularly in content teams, is having a quota of having to have, you know, X Y Z content out per month, per week, whatever. Two hundred word blog posts that X times, right? Like, is right, that what exactly? You mean? And it gives. There's no. There's no room and there's no time and there's no ability to create to craft something that is unique that really has uh, the, the the better value for your customers well yeah and i think I, I will go further with you on this okay so one is there's this 
the people creating the content, let's say in the content marketing team or outsource thing, they're pretty far away from the people driving the revenue sometimes. And if you could, you know, get more of the people driving the revenue to input their expertise, the subject matter experts to enable like the types of content that customers would care about, um, that would probably help, right? I, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Like, cause it feels like the, the, to know the customer and to create something that customer cares about, you gotta be talking to the customer. And I think there's a lot of marketers and that, that I find that they would be like terrified of actually hopping on a, on a call with a customer and that, which is sad to, to me um, to see that pattern. How do you break that? <laughs> Well, that's interesting that you said that because um, in my book, um, Smart Mar Marketing Execution, we do have a chapter and we do have a, have a uh, module in my system on sales enablement. Yeah. And one of the things that we recommend is ride-alongs. Marketing, riding along with sales um, could be physically if they're going door to door or it could be virtually if they're showing up at yeah. meetings to actually experience on a minute by minute basis in that meeting what the salesperson is is doing how they how they um, interacting with the customer um, a lot of the time it's a it's a mindset what i say is is when i think about marketing and sales i say well marketing is looking at the forest and sales is looking at the tree they can cut down very different viewpoints yeah and well, I think yeah. you have to, they both have to understand each other's viewpoint in order to create content that's going to resonate with the, the individual. I do think that that marketing sometimes, I have had this experience in my corporate career, marketing has this attitude, well, we, we've done the research, we've created this, we know best, and they, they do not let the, uh, you know, they don't bring in the salesperson who's actually talking to the customer. And I think that's a mistake. Yeah. And I think we, we have a buzzword that we've developed that marketing in this current world, right? Like where it's much more digital, most of the sales cycle uh, happens in digital context. We have a saying that marketers need to be selling and salespeople need to get their DNA into the marketing content and have conversational marketing content that mimics some of their traditionally early discovery uh, conversations that would be done by sales. So it's sort of like bridging of these two worlds. And I'm sharing with the audience now one of my personal favorites from your uh, from your book, like the visual of the buyer journey uh, when the different types of actions that the buyer needs to make and then the content that supports it. And what I find uh, terrifying, frankly, is that and one of the symptoms of the problem that I think persists in part because of the technology industry from which I come from is that the, the marketing tools are different than the sales tools. And, and so when marketing creates a, you know, a downloadable uh, link to a downloadable thing on a blog of some kind or, or a landing page, the salespeople can't use that necessarily because they don't want to send their client who they know who they are to go and be registered in a marketing um, in a marketing resource. When when marketers send the PDF, salespeople can't. What do they do? Well, how do you put that PDF inside a PowerPoint? You can't, and so you end up having these sort of really disjointed emails that have like, here's my deck, and here's like three links to these case studies. And here I downloaded this PDF for you so you don't have to go to our landing page and give your email. And by the way, on page 54 here, you could get that answer to the question that you had. It sounds incredibly painful. And it just, if you're using the wrong tools, how do you connect? Like, what? How do you help customers get around that? Well, absolutely. That uh, you just described a couple of my own personal horror stories and working with people. And I, the issue I think is again understanding, and, and this goes in a little bit of, of a different direction, but I think it's important to the conversation. Understanding the difference between a marketing qualified lead and a sales qualified lead. Yeah. 
Okay. So the content that we're talking about here in the customer journey uh, graphic that you just showed is really mar for marketing qualified leads, not sales qualified leads. So it's to get the marketing lead in the door so that marketing can score it and then let sales know, you know, if it's a if it's a warm, hot, or cold lead. So it has to be, there has to be different content for, for different, marketing yeah. and sales. So yeah. marketing content is looking for uh, somebody who is interested and they may be, you know, but what we're, we're wanting them to get to is that point of conversion. So they need to, they need to take them down that journey to the point where they are, they are ready for a sales conversation. And I think one of the biggest issues that happens with content is that content gets sent out there and then it's like our job's done. We, we yeah. sent out some content and the, the salesperson isn't really given the level of lead that they can really work with. And I think that's one of the areas that creates the, the finger pointing and the, and the friction between marketing and sales. Sales qualified leads and the content that sales has, and this is based on the interviews I did for my book mm -hmm. with, with my sales professional colleagues, it has to be specifically targeted, uniquely targeted to the pain point that the salesperson is discussing with that prospect at that stage of their, of their journey, of, at that stage of the conversation. So the initial sales conversation content is likely to be, let me let me learn more about you. Let's have a demo. Now I'm just using examples here. Yeah. And then the second conversation is going to be, okay, I now, I like the demo. I'm interested in the product. I want to know what other companies have experienced with this product. So then that would be your case study or your your user te video testimonial, something like that. So so that's the pattern that I would see. Right, and I'd say th this is very true for the world where, from which I came from of enterprise, large large sales um, at kind of places like Success Factors and Salesforce. And I think now, right, and you know HubSpot very well, you know, and we had you know great guests like Scott Brinker from HubSpot. Like HubSpot right. has migrated, right, from a more traditional, hey, there's marketing driving, you know, from MQLs to SQLs, and then there's like the sort of other sales content. They've drawn down the path of more product-led growth and more of this hybrid where you're expanding from one product to another. And that world, in my view, is incredibly messy. And it does not fit, like while the pipeline metaphor still works right. because there is nothing better, but in reality, it's it's sort of like quantum physics version of that pipeline was like stuff moving around randomly. And then one interaction was an electron drives you off into back into the funnel and then forwards. And so Absolutely. you oftentimes take steps back, right? And so the point is, the, in my head, is the world where we could separate the MQL to SQL to a customer, that world is gone, right? That That is sort of, it's a nice illustration, like any model, it's still a good place to start if you're learning about marketing 101, right? But it's not the reality of how customers actually buy most modern products, most multi-product offerings. They, they're kind of, there are people that are on stage zero. They don't know, they, they're kind of figuring out what this company does, they're figuring out what the products are. There are products you know nothing about. And then you right. can be very deep inside something. And if you're deep inside something and you're deep in a sales cycle, to, in my view, they still the huge problem that marketing created a bunch of case studies, but they sit in some sort of a marketing library that's very different than what salespeople use. Right. And so the salespeople, like, you know, there's that quote that 90% of marketing content never even gets used, right? And that sort of, that's in, that becomes another tragedy where, because they're using different tools, different systems, salesperson doesn't know how to integrate that marketing case study that you were talking about. And so that, it makes it even worse, right? Because the, the tooling is separate, right? Oh, this is for your you know, CRM, but it's not for your marketing automation and it's not for your Salesforce 
automation and it's, you know, and then we, you know, email is completely different. What, what's your kind of take on where the future is going to take us? Do you agree with this assessment that it's all getting blurry or do you still see, see more traditional uh, pipeline kind of work in some places? No, I would agree with you. I think I think it really is. I think that the 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 fundamentals still um, are still there in terms of understanding the difference between the the two types of leads. But I would agree with you one hundred percent that in terms of the actual customer experience, that it's very different and it has to be re related to differently. And so let's talk about customer or buyer experience, right? And we talked we talked about content. So let's say somebody's brought you on, and they, you you've kind of helped them. You listen to their customers. They created this beautiful content that either supports later stage sales process or earlier educational content. And but the the content is delivered in the let's say old fashioned experience, and maybe not a very consumable experience right and, and because b2b as you very well know is sort of a, a, you know a few a decade or two behind maybe what's happening in b2c world but at the same time some b2b buyers are you know gen gen whatever gen right like it's an earlier okay. gen than than than, <laughs> than <Absolutely>. i am <laughs> right <laughs> whatever that is <laughs> and then some of them are and they even people like myself, right? Like we're increasingly conditioned by all the media that we consume uh, to, 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 you know, to, to get distracted. Like our attention needs to be captured. You know, we have limited bandwidth to process something. And so here, then we show up was like, look at how smart we are. Like we got this, I mean, maybe even a great message, but there's like, people get lost at the very beginning and they never come back. That's a pattern that we see. What, what's your, what are you seeing uh, from your customers in terms of the great message not connecting with the audience? Uh, I mean, are you saying that why it doesn't connect with the audience? Yeah, like, so let's say we got the message right, right? Let's say we invested, got the message right. Let's say we paid a boatload of money to Google and got the right message and the right audience. And they still somehow like don't really, like you said, they they are not getting this they they downloaded the they signed up they download the ebook but they never read the ebook as a as a good example and so why like we have some hypotheses that relate to why they don't right like but what's your take where there's this sort of you know like a leakage it, like where hey somebody's interested motivated but the way we present the information is not connecting with the recipient of that information and so the message doesn't get through. I, I, yes, I would, I would absolutely add to that, that it is really becoming more and more how the, the customer experiences the content in terms of it, um, their first um, look at it. So for example, one of the things that, that people really need to, to rethink is, you know, these massive white papers and all of this, you know, large, heavy text content, you would be better off doing something. And this is something that a, a client of ours did really successfully. And that is creating little serial videos. Right. So they did weekly content, like, like the old time serials in old time magazines where, you know, every week they would get a little video message that was five minutes that just shared the next nugget of information. So you're waiting then to see like what's going to happen. So they're yeah. creating expectation. They are creating experience. And I think most importantly, Alex, they're creating relationship with that, with that client. I think the missing ingredient in a lot of times in the kind of content that you're describing that, that um, like old fashioned content we need to get rid of. It has not only does it lack experience, it lacks relational uh, information it lacks it lacks creating a relationship with the customer and that has got to it's got to be driven back from the relationship through the experience then to what you're trying the message you're trying to convey it's not right. create a message and then and then figure out how to make it an experience and then figure out how to create the relationship it's like start with the relationship step back into the experience then create the content that is going to truly create a new relationship and you can use like even a dating analogy. So 
the first time that you connect with that customer, you want to give them coffee and a bagel. You yeah. don't want to give them, you know, a full meal. Um, the next time you want to give them maybe a little bit more, maybe it's, it's a lunch, um, you know, something, something along that way. And then more of an experience, the movie, the movie date night experience, and then maybe cooking a meal together. So they, they are getting, you know, really interacting with you and really getting immersed yeah. in what you're trying to give them. That's as opposed that's to like, of. as opposed to like, Hey, you know, here's a, here's our hundred page, you know, document, which right. is kind of the equivalent of like, let's get married right now because, uh, you know, <laughs> exactly because it sounds like we're interested in, <laughs> it sounds like you're interested in the same stuff we are interested in. Here's exactly. Pages, right? Okay. Well, we have a slightly interesting take on this. I'm curious what your thought is. Um, there's like in using the dating analogy, there's been one of my friends has read this book called the game, which was popular mm -hmm. around like, the, the broader idea is like, how do you create, you know, quicker, how do you create an environment where you could go faster, deeper when connecting with somebody? And I think generally in this digital crazy world that we live in, to some degree, there's something to this as well. Like, like how do you create maybe different experiences during one date to have a sense of like, okay, well, we had the coffee and then we went for a walk and then like the walk is very natural and you know, we're getting hungry and then maybe we grab a dinner. And so we sit down at a different restaurant and then maybe we go for cocktails and something like that and then end up in a nightclub, et cetera. So you now had five or six different mediums to interact with that person. And assuming the magic is there, right? You can't force it, right? But assuming there's right. a connection exactly. um, and that there is a re resonance, what's happening in in my assessment in that, in that metaphor is what, what you actually are having five five dates effectively right because there's an environmental switch yeah. now when i take this back to the b2b universe that we live in right like if i have a wall of text right in that thing that you're describing and nothing but wall of text and not even like an occasionally an image but not even a particularly good illustration this is like a one really really long boring date right? That I will never want to have another experience. But if I have a little bit of text and then I have like maybe like an exciting, you know, movement of some sort, because we are all crocodile brains, we need some movement novelty. And then I have later, I have like, oh, well, like, this is an area that I'm interested in. So let's, I want to have our date in this direction. And then like you go in that direction, you choose. So you're picking, making a choice and there you're drilling in stuff that you're interested in. And then there's a video there, right? To your point. And I want to listen to that video or maybe an audio podcast. So, you know, playing with that metaphor, it feels like we could create, we don't need to wait for weeks, right? Like so we could, but we don't need to if we create an opportunity for people to take the next step when they're most interested. And that to me seems like the magic, if you have the right customer, if they are interested, why are we putting these crazy barriers in them? Like I just filled in my, my personal details. Now I have to go look for your email out of my spam folder to download something. Then I download it and it's like, ah, I can't even click into it, like this 80 page thing. I don't, because I have to go, go manually like page by page by page. And I'm intimidated by the fact that I see 80 pages is the first thing that I see there. And so do you, you see what I'm, where I'm going is we're Absolutely. creating these, we're like killing our dates and romantic opportunities like that instead yeah. of like, yeah, we could start with no pressure and then move, move further along if there's an interest. What, what, how do you think about this metaphor? So I think that, that exactly what you're talking about works for one core reason and that is when you are when you are um, building a, a you know the dating sequence that you just talked about, you're building relationships and yeah. you're building on top of what you know from the last conversation. You're not just saying, "Oh, hey, here's more information." You're saying, "Oh, well, we talked about the fact that you, uh, you know, you love to cook meals. Um, now let's build on that." And I think that's something that the B C brands do really well is they, they capture the data. They, they know capture the data 
And then the, the next interaction is more personalized. Oh, I'll give you a great example. So I'm doing my Christmas shopping like a lot of people are doing right now and looking for um, certain clothes items for, you know, my sister and people. And um, one of the brands that my sister likes a lot is Madewell. Now, I looked at something on Madewell and I didn't do anything about it. I just I clicked at it. I looked at the price. I just got busy and didn't, didn't do anything back. And so then the next email I got was, oh, well, you, you know, you check this out. You, you can get that and you can get this. And so like they know what I know what I've looked at. They they know what I uh, wanted to get. They're suggesting ways to make it easier for me to buy it. That is something that B2B really needs to learn how to do is to build on the interaction with the next interaction, not just say, oh, you liked my content. So let's give you more content or let's give you more content. Let's say you liked my uh, story about X, Y, Z. I think software that does that specifically very well is proposal software. I don't know if you've looked at any of the proposal softwares out there, but what it does is when you when you use proposal software and you give your client a proposal, some of the some of the systems will will record how much time that buyer is spending on that section. So, for example, if they're spending a lot of time on price, then you can come back with them and say, oh, we just wanted to let you know we have a pricing discount coming up and you can take advantage of it, you know, for the next five days. So you can actually build on the experience they're having. And I think Absolutely. More we need to do that. Well, uh, yeah, so this is near and dear. And I need to do a better job educating you what we're up to and relate to. But we actually power digital proposals as well as kind of digital, like we are leader in that on G2, which is customer reviews and digital uh, sales rooms, which we don't like the word sales because it's more about the buyer. But like let's say it's a client or a buyer room. And if you're doing it, the the we call what you're capturing there is digital body language, and this is so. What one example is like how do you follow up? Another example is like who do you not follow up with? That's sort of really valuable, right? Because there's people right, exactly. that are just using you and writing you along for somebody that um, is you know they're going to choose, and a lot of um, uh, small businesses could you know or, or mid-sized businesses or any large businesses don't have the resources to pursue every opportunity. And they're effectively being strung along because the you know you're sending documentation, people don't look at it. So it's exactly. been really interesting to see to see that um, thing. So we agree with you on that, and, and I think the insight uh, allows you to then follow up intelligently. So last question, uh, Claire, on kind of the way uh, you've described something in um, you know throughout this conversation is a sort of default to what people know. And I think there's there's one of your posts that I like it's that you say, what we commonly see under pressure to make things happen is clients typically default to what they've done before or they go after the latest, brightest, shiny object that are, has appeared in marketing. And we know our philosophy is that we need to go to foundational principles, right? Like, so that, that versus the shiny objects. Exactly. What do you think is the counter... Um, counter to the sort of shiny object syndrome, right? Oh, podcasts are cool. Let's do, I'll do podcasts. And then we do half behind, you know, half fast. pardon my French right. uh, job of doing this. And then we move on to something next, right? Like versus, you know, making a deliberate decision. Um, is, is this sort of the planning stage of the blueprint? Is it really doing experiments and then, you know, quickly and then, you know, doubling down to make, to bring those experiments, picking the right experiments that work. How do you help your clients with that? So that is actually in the second component of, of our model, um, Octane Growth System. It's strategy, execution, and automation. So the smart execution model actually calls for the building of the roadmap. And we do it differently in the fact that when we are building the roadmap, we are actually evaluating multiple alternative routes before we recommend a campaign or a strategy and we recommend we we evaluate them based on what we can predict and we do have a formula for predicting 
Uh, it's not exact, but it is. it can give the um, company, the decision maker, a pretty good idea of what is the best ROI. Um, Got it. So you have yeah, kind of an ROI predictor to help people avoid. Right. avoid because default otherwise, control. you know, you, you can do 100 things in marketing. There's probably two or three you should do. How do you choose? You start benchmarking what the how well that that campaign is run. And, the, and there's it's there's an easy way to do that. Look at what your historical results have been. Look at what your agency's historical results have been. And then look at what the industry benchmarks can tell you. And you can get a pretty good indication as to what the return on investment of different um, programs for your industry are going to be. Got it. But well, I got an, sorry, go ahead. I said a lot of people don't take the time to do that. Well, I I'm glad I took the time for this conversation. This was amazing. I got a huge ROI from it already, Claire. How can people find you and follow up with you? So what I'd love to do for your audience, Alex, is uh, give them a special offer. If they go to my website, octanegrowth.com backslash my offer, and that's octane spelled O-C-T-A-I-N growth.com backslash my offer. They can download the first chapter of my book. And if they're interested, they can, they can book a discovery call with me. And what we will do in that call is we will not try to sell them a program. We will, that call is to help them solve a problem in real time. Well, I'm signing up for that. Thank you very much, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. You got, you got an audience already. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Claire. Uh, Octane Growth System, uh, bringing marketing execution to the world. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Alex.